research has shown that you actually lose a week a year, the equivalent of vacation, by re-reading information. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Fairley. How do I start to try? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? The most unselfish thing a person could do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Bailey. If you're watching on YouTube, which you totally should, you're going to want to hit that subscribe button, especially if you have not yet. And then also there's a little bell that you can ring and it'll actually give you notifications of when things go live. Things are bombarding us from all over the internet, from the news, from our social media, disruptive marketing. It's nice to have things that break those cycles, that give you confidence, power, and an edge on the competition to go out there and achieve, to help more people, and really just feel freaking good in the day. And one of the ways to do that is by tuning into the Billion Dollar Brotherhood. Today's interview is absolutely fire. I'm super pumped. Yet if you have also not checked out the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, you're going to want to go over there and help us out with a five-star review. Now, if you're brand new, I don't expect this from you. Yet if you've been getting value from the show, if you've known us from any length of time, this is my ask. Head over there to iTunes. Give us that five-star rate and review if we deserve it. And write that quick review. I'd love to read it and say thank you to you so that we can absolutely dominate in this space and reach more men because our goal is to redefine what it means to be a businessman, change the dictionary definition where you cannot be a businessman without prospering health, wealth, and relationships, and to take your transformation of your life transforming and to take those results and consult every major world leader on how they run their country. And it all starts here, learning from the interviews like the people I'm about to bring on so that you can execute on the things that they teach, which is totally executable today so that you can see a transformation in your life. This is the CEO of the Ultimate Sales Machine. They've trained over 240,000 business owners since 1991. Maybe you've checked out the book, The Ultimate Sales Machine. I'm bringing on the new CEO and the daughter of the legacy, Miss Amanda Holmes. Amanda, welcome to the Billion Dollar Brotherhood podcast. So happy to be here. I know. We met on Clubhouse first off, which is like the the origin story of how we built a friendship. And then we actually went into the DMs on Instagram, which is pretty crazy as well. Uh, crazy things happen in the DMs. I'm sure more for women than guys. Uh, actually, we get lots of spammy stuff as guys in the DMs. And my wife is the one who actually manages some of like my, our requested folder, which yours must be crazy. And there's probably a lot of spam for you as well. But anyway, there's also gold. So if people haven't checked that out, the requested folder, they're going to want to go do that. Um, but I'm just super impressed by what you've done as the CEO of a large company now. And, and obviously your dad writing the ultimate sales machine. And uh, just we were in a clubhouse together talking about sales and you were just killing it. And I was super impressed. And I knew right away that I had to have you on the show. And I've been watching you just grind, 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 not just working hard for no reason, because we know that working hard doesn't necessarily produce results, but working hard for a reason, like the Dream 100 stuff that you're putting out right now. So I just want to honor you for that. And thank you again for being here. Oh, thank you so much. I can't wait to see what we come up with today. Uh, dude, I'm excited too. So let's go first off a little bit back. That way we get some context of the story of how you became the CEO, why you shaved your head, which is was crazy. I read the whole story about it, which is very bold of you. Take me through the process of, of a little bit of how you grew up to becoming CEO. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I was a competitive gymnast for 12 years. That really taught me a lot about doing things that absolutely frighten and terrify you. You know, you jump and do a backflip on a four inch beam and it kind of trains you on discipline and determination. Uh, then I went to becoming a singer. So when I and when my father passed, I was a singer songwriter. I had released my fourth record. I was touring. I was playing the guitar. The only business I'd known, I still ran the most profitable tour out of any of my friends. Nobody knew how to run profitable tours, which by the way, 65% of businesses are not profitable. So it's kind of a hard thing to do. I'm looking around at hundreds of staff. They're all double my age. I run a consulting coaching company, one of the, you know, the best in the world. These people are fantastic at what they do. 
and we service businesses that are trying to get from a million to five, from 10 to 20, from 20 to 100. And here I am, <laughs> a little singer songwriter, like, what have I gotten myself into? This is terrible. Who wants to be a part of this? Not I. So <laughs> it was a quite a journey to go from that to fast forward to today. It's been eight years. I've been CEO for the last six. And, uh, you know, we're still growing and serving clientele and we doubled sales last year. It was wonderful. And just looking, look into the future. I feel like there's a lot of people. I know that one of our guys, Yagal, he was actually, he opened for like some bands back in the day and then went into the pawn industry. There's some other guys I know that were in the music industry as well. And they've, they've had this balance of, I always say that you find your purpose when your responsibilities and your passions kind of overlap. Cause mm -hmm. I've done passions before and they weren't profitable at all. And I've done responsibilities before, like taking care of my family, and I felt dead inside. What was the balance for you? Like, do you ever have times where you're like, I need to have that outlet of going back to music? What do you do to kind of have that balance of what you're passionate about and taking care of your responsibilities as a CEO? Do they fit underneath the company or are you just so passionate? You love everything you do or do you have some hobbies as well? Oh, well, my heart and soul is really in a nonprofit, it's called Divine Bliss International. And I've lived several years actually in their healing centers, one in Singapore, I spent some time in Singapore living there, and then also in Florida, where um, they, they teach, because my father passed at 55, it, he basically just worked himself into his grave. So that was my huge hesitation of, I don't wanna jump right into the grave right next to him you know i want to learn from what he went through and change myself so i was lucky enough to meet my mentor who's actually an indian saint her formal title is sarvalokama her holiness shri 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 1008 guruji punamji i refer to her as guruji and she has this center in florida where that was my sanctuary that is my place where you know, I spend time, they have a community garden teaching people how to balance their bodies and, and get fit by just digging in the dirt and learning gratitude from pulling weeds in the ground and knowing where your food comes from. Because who knows if Kingston will even know where his food comes from or how it's developed so that he can have a healthy diet and a, and a healthy way of life. So I've, that is my passion and and. My music kind of fell into that as well because uh, Guruji taught me a lot about um, mantra meditation. And because when you sit silent, the monkey mind just gets louder. It's not about sitting in silence. If you can use the sound of your own voice to calm and, and calm the mind so that you actually elevate your consciousness, it's a whole, it's a, that is the point of meditation is to have this elevated form of consciousness. So I believe that mantra meditation actually gets you there. And so I've, I've studied that quite a bit with Sanskrit chants and such. So interesting. I, there's things that we get into when we're younger. Like I got into motocross cause my dad bought me a motorcycle. If it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't have done it. And internet marketing was much the same. It's almost like this weird, like luck <laughs> plus opportunity. I showed up to an event. I learned about internet marketing over, traditional style marketing or traditional businesses. And that's how I got in the online marketing space for you. Was it your father passing or was it something inside of you already that got you into this? Cause there's something that happens that gets us to go learn from someone who has a name that's 50 syllables long and it's a master and like learn it. You know what I mean? There's always something that happens that then drives us to go do that. Was it something that you were just around or was it something where something happened and you were searching and you found the answer through that mentor? Well, so when my father was diagnosed with leukemia, we, we had two people on staff looking for an alternative and we came up with 150 of the best doctors around the world. I mean, we looked at sound therapy, light therapy, oxygenation therapy, uh, pre-speaking in tongues. I studied with monks from Japan, energy healing. I, and then that's how I met my guru. And at the time I had celiac disease. So uh, just the smell of wheat, I couldn't go into a pizza parlor without getting nauseous and ill, let alone if I actually had it, I would go to the hospital. And she said that you can cure yourself of disease. It's just a dis-ease of our minds. Today, I'm cured of celiacs. She, she actually cured me of it so I can eat wheat all I like, but I choose not to. 
as much because I think that the way that we process our our wheat isn't so great. Um, but yeah, that that's really what brought me. And CHI wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the self mastery that I was so committed and dedicated to after my father passed to be able to get through the limiting beliefs in my head uh, of stepping in and and continuing on and creating a new company, really. It feels like you took on the mantle of your father and, I, and I'm totally assuming, but just from a distance, what I've seen, it's like you've taken on that mantle, that weight or that prestige. Almost, We always talk about that. I want my guys, that my ceiling to be their floor. Wherever I've been in life, whatever breakthrough I've had, I want that to be like the starting point. And it seems like you've done that really well. There's many people out there that may go, I'm just going to, I don't want to ever walk in the footsteps or be the same. You know, I don't want people to say, Oh, you just took over your dad's business. And so they go out there and try to do their own thing, be their own person. I feel that you've done a great job coupling your own breakthrough, your own spin, the new things you've learned. You said your father passed at 55. It's very freaking young. Uh, my father-in-law, his dad passed at 54. I remember how emotional it was when he went past that same age. He's like, I'm the age that my dad was when he passed. And his goal was like, I don't want to go. I want to be here for Kingston. I want to be here for family. Tell me the balance of that. What were the things that you really took on from your dad? And you're like, oh, God, I need to run with this. This is something that's like gold. And what was the other half of it where you brought in your spin of the things that you had learned that maybe he didn't get to learn because you allowed his ceiling to be your floor to build upon? I think the biggest change was in culture, the culture of the company. Um, so he has a system that's just tried and true. I mean, we've assisted over 250,000 businesses at this point. I mean, the book is in 15 languages. It works. It works. <laughs> you just can't deny that, right? Uh, so his methodology is what needed to carry on. And the essence is still brilliant, but there's updating that needed to happen, right? So, you know, explaining how that works on Instagram now. Even even today, I had this light bulb in my Instagram um, uh, stories where he teaches when he was writing ads for, uh, he worked for billionaire Charlie Munger, who's the co-chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, and his ads pulled better than anyone else's. And he, one of the things he said that's really helpful is in an ad, if you have a person, their face in it, it's you're way highly, way more highly likely to get their attention, somebody watching it, because it's that person. So even if you're selling a pen, you want to have somebody holding the pen, right? And I noticed the same thing in my Instagram story that if I had just text, it's not really all that entertaining. But when I swiped up and added a person looking at the text or dancing to the text, I'm like, oh, it's the same thing. It's just an Instagram now instead of in a newspaper. So being able to take those methods and bringing them to the modern time was important. But then where I really said, I put my foot down and said, this is how you run your company. This is how I'm going to run my company is in cul company culture. There was a lot of um, very aggressive um, brutal. It just was a very terrible company culture. I mean, they all loved my father. They loved him. I mean, they would lay down dead for him, but, but there was just vicious catty activities that, that me as a CEO, I would, I just, I've let go of all of that and chosen people that I can trust and that I know has my back as opposed to will stab it if I'm looking the wrong way. So <laughs> That was a big, that was a big thing. And then uh, I have two ways I want to go, but first off, what's the difference in personality between your dad and you? And I, I never thought I'd go this way, but it's just fun for me because his personality type, you know, I'm, I'm a high D personality on disc and, and we get into other ones yet. Oftentimes that like a passion comes across as anger. You know, it's okay. like fear is being taken advantage of. There's all these different things. I'm assuming maybe you had a little bit different personality than your father that allowed you to, step in and, and maybe have strengths in an area that, that not saying he didn't, he just was focused on other areas. What, what's the difference do you feel? I'll give you an example. So my father was born from the Bronx, uh, very much like when him and my mother first got married, they would drink their cereal with water because they didn't have enough money for milk. And so he kind of always had this chip on his shoulder, like, I'm going to prove myself, right? Because uh, he just came from nothing. And it's amazing what he was able to what what he was able to do over his time. Like, he didn't even graduate 
high school. So his secretary was the one that was teaching him how to like form sentences. <laughs> like it was, and, and the fact that he's a New York Times bestseller, he never shared that because he was so embarrassed of it. But to me, what a victory, right? Um, but then I grew up with my mother who was just salt of the earth from the Midwest. I've never met somebody that didn't love my mother. And my father would bring her to meetings uh, like for dinner with prospects to win them because he was so in your face and so harsh. And my mother was just so loving that they thought, well, if she's so loving and she's with him, then he has to be you know, a nicer, calmer guy somewhere in here. So um, I, I was blessed with the gift of my mother would be the answer of that. So I'd like to think that you know, I have the pig-headed discipline and determination of my father. And when I'm really focused on something, like you could put a blender on in a room and I won't hear it when I'm that focused. But then I also just have the loving, I'll, I'm a lover. I'm a lover. What's funny is that your dad had like another sales secret right there, which is like, bring your spouse along. It's like, <laughs> that, like that, that's so true though. With a lot of our guys, I'm like, man, there's some of them where I go, and they're pretty brutal, but like their wife's amazing or their girlfriend's amazing. And if they like them, then they must be okay. You know, I'm like, oh, they're like, there's a rapport building with that. That's so interesting that you talked about. And then the one thing I wanted to touch on that you talked about with your dad, the things that he had written about or talked about or spoke about or trained about being modernized with Instagram or how do you apply it? One thing that I love from my time with Jay Abraham is that he always talked about things that stood the test of time. I actually just listened to him the other day and he talked about, well, there's 10,000 different tactics to make money, but there's like three ways to really make money that all those tactics fall under. And those are the things that stand the test of time. If you tell, tell someone, well, this is how you set up a profile picture and you need to make sure there's a ring around and you tell the tactic of it, it may only last for, <laughs> it may only last for a day, today's day and age. Yet with something like your father taught or the things that you're teaching, it's the things that no matter what will fall under the umbrella of that. Just like you talked about, this is exactly what he talked about before yet. It's in a way that's just digital now, like having a face. I mean, selling houses is one of the oldest jobs or businesses out there. And what do the realtors always do? They put a face on a billboard cause it's a face that you can trust, or they put a face on their sign. Cause you're like, Oh, they're smiling. They look nice. Like they don't seem that intimidating. I'm going to call. Whereas, if it's not the face, then it has to be a brand that's like the best in the world. It's like Keller Williams. You're like, oh, I trust it because of the 100 years or 50 years or whatever it is that they've been around. And so just to take away from the people listening, take that away for sure. And make sure to grab the book as well. There's no reason not to. Um, books to me are the most, I had John Lee Dumas on just a, a, two weeks ago and he wrote a book and it's like 20 bucks. And I'm sitting there like, you put all this time into this book. And it's all your best stuff. It's like diluted. It's like concentrate of all the best stuff in the world. And it's 20 bucks. It makes no sense. So make sure to grab the book if you're listening right now, Ultimate Sales Machine. Uh, go ahead. You, you have something you want to say about that. I have to say that people, my father's clients were actually pissed when he first came out with the book. Because they're like, I spent $250,000 with you to learn what you put in that book for $15. Absurd. And think about... $250,000 at the time as well. Cause even over the yeah. last 10 years, 250 grand isn't the same as it was back then with all the charts and everything. They think like uh, inflation is like 8% a year. So you do that every single year for a while. And the hundred thousand dollars that people buried in their backyard 20 years ago is definitely <laughs> the same hundred thousand dollars, just with less buying power now than it had back then, which is interesting why money moving is what's most important in building it. So I know that we were talking beforehand, I wanna jump into some of these secrets that you have with time management hacks that billionaires use, mostly because I wanna rip them off myself and use them in my <laughs> own life, not to teach, but to, to actually implement, which is also a good point for people to know as well, is that don't listen to things so that you can go and tell people about it. The most important thing that you do with the information from the show is to actually do it because it doesn't matter if people know it. It matters that you do it. And then you can let people know if you want. Yet reaping the benefits and the rewards in your life is most important. So break them down for me. Give me the overview and I'm going to be taking notes. 
Okay, so this originated when my father was working for Charlie Munger. So Charlie Munger's a billionaire, right? And my father was working in nine of his companies and he just could not keep up. He was he was spending all day in the office just replying to everyone else's questions. Hey, got a minute? Got a minute? Got a minute meetings would break out all of a sudden. And then three hours later, everything that you had planned would not get done. So then he'd get home from the office and then do all of his work. Like he wasn't even used to working at the office because there was so many people asking for his attention. So then he created, <laughs> I won't go into the details of the story. It's really freaking funny, but uh, it's in the book. Um, so then he created six steps to make sure that your time management can increase by 500%. And I will tell you, as I'm, I'm in the middle of a launch right now, uh, we created a, a wonderful new product and every single moment is accounted for for me right now. I mean, I'm, I, the last six days I've slept maybe three hours a night. Last night I got five, but it, it's been insane. So when you know that every moment counts, how do you utilize it best? It goes something like this. I will tell you that I like to write it on a on a paper so that I have it separate from all of my devices. And so, the audio people, she has the yellow flip paper, by the way, from like the original paper that came out 200 years ago. It's amazing. <laughs> 200 years ago. Okay. Step number one to the six step formula, touch it once. So research has shown that you actually lose a week a year the equivalent of vacation by rereading information rereading so like how many times have you reread an email uh and and gone to, gone to search for it so when you know you're going to do something touch it once if you know okay i want to read this email it's going to take me some time i'm going to read it first i reply back to them and say hey you know i need I, I can reply to this later or even putting it into a folder that you say, this is when I'm going to do it later. Don't sit there and go, oh, I know I need to reply to this email and read it 50 times, right? First hack, touch it once. Okay, step number yeah, one. Say, I failed that one so far. I, <laughs> I have so many Voxer messages with all of our coaching students and sometimes I'll listen and I'll go, oh man, that one's like really in depth. I need, I need to listen to that again. Uh, so failed number one, go ahead. Well, this is also a good point. So you're saying, so what, what we teach is to have at least one hour a week where you're meeting with your staff. So for you, I'm sure you have different times in your, in your schedule for your clients. So when he'd have an email that was like 10, you know, a crazy long email, he would say, his reply would be, let's discuss this in our weekly call. Bam, done. I've assumed I've finished it and now it's on him to bring it back when we have our meeting. That would be a good hack for you. So I don't know if you awesome. you can put that in there, but that's one totally. it was that's amazing. over and over again. I can't talk about this now, that's too long. You, you know, Don't expect me <laughs> to email you a huge long reply, let's discuss it in our meeting, right? Put it on the agenda. So that was um, touch it once. Touch. Okay, step number two, list off your top six things that you have to do in the day. So a lot of people will list off 20 things, 30 things, so then they're checking off their list and they're feeling so proud because they're doing all of these things and getting them done. But we really have to care about what's most important. And for any anybody that's trying to level up in their lives, prioritization is key. So what are those six things? So just list your six. That's step number two, okay? Step number three, this is crucial because yeah, you may have your steps, but how much time will it take each step? So allocate how much time. Okay, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes to this. I'm going to spend an hour for this. Um, and then what you realize is in step number four, when you start prioritizing which things you need, and then step number five, putting them into your schedule, this is the game changer because just to have a to-do list is one thing, but to actually look and say, okay, wow, I thought I would have enough time to do this thing, this thing, and this thing, but I won't. So I'm going to make sure that the most important thing that I have to get done today is actually going to be at the top of my day because I'm fresh and I'm ready. And then when I know I have 15 minutes, I think I can write that email to 
to you know somebody that I'm trying to close as business, and I'll put that right before lunch so that you know I, I can have a relaxing time. And then right after lunch, this is what I'm gonna do. So even if you're chunking it down to 15 minutes, I'm gonna do this. Two hours, I'm gonna do that. It it manages the expectation of your day so that by the end of the day, you've been the most productive with the time and you've met the expectation. Whereas if you're just writing down these lists and you look and you know five hours have gone by and you're like, oh, I didn't get anything I wanted done today. Well, yeah, because you didn't figure out how much time it would take and then prioritize it and put it into the list. Does that make sense? 100%. Okay, great. And then the last step is to throw it away. If there's something that you don't need, let it go. We don't need to be hoarders. We don't need to hold on to stuff. Just let it go. <laughs> so that is well, six steps. Yeah. The, the thing that I love about it is that when I first started really seeing momentum, I remember I was at first started business, did pretty well. Thought I told everyone I was retired. I thought that I was good for the rest. I was 20 going into 21, had a lot of success in a short amount of time and lost it all, everything. I was cleaning carpets for my dad. And I just remember wanting, and I'm kind of just like putting myself back. And for people that are listening right now that, that do some of this stuff, maybe it's that formula that you just needed to be like, oh, I needed to be reset on like all the steps. Maybe you do some of them, but it's really when you make bread or you make a meal, if you only have some of the ingredients, it's not going to taste the same at all. Just newsflash. So for that, that's for the experienced people. Going back in my life though, I remember sitting there cleaning carpets and I thought, if I could just talk like an entrepreneur, I'd be happy. They said all these quotes and stuff. I was like, man, they like know their stuff. Like they say like KPIs and man, like I need to know what this stuff is. I just wanted to talk the talk. I had low expectations at this point because I had failed really, really bad. And I remember it just came down to like swinging the ax at first. I just started going like, okay, I'm going to post on social media three times a day and I'm going to, I'm going to follow up with people. And I just started doing all this activity. And I feel that as our company has grown, the biggest thing that shift is the time sharpening the ax and everything you just talked about had everything to do with laying the foundation of execution, not even just the execution part besides maybe number one, which was just touch it once. And I thought that was really cool for everyone listening is that starting out with planning and preparing the way I know that every week we have our weekly planning every day we have our daily planning and I spend so much more time or invest more time planning the day than I ever have before and it's weird how using and I'm going to use some of the things that you just talked about to complete my recipe how much I get done with the less time that it feels awkward because you feel like you've been conditioned to have to work all the time to see some type of breakthrough. So I just want to say, acknowledge you for that. That was really good. And for the people listening, take notes on all six. I, I just want to add to that because billionaires have the same 24 hours in a day. The difference between them and anybody is that they're smarter about their time. And something that we teach is that mastery isn't about doing 4,000 different things. It's about doing 12 things 4,000 times. So if you decided, okay, one skill that I'm going to become a master at, it is time. That will make a dramatic difference, dramatic difference in your life. And like you're saying, right? So when I start to become more of an expert in my day, I think about myself holistically and I realize, wow, well, I feel a lot better when I work out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan out my day so that I have my workout in there and I'm going to plan out my day. So I have my meditation in there because that's what fills my soul. Right? So I a hundred percent agree with what you're saying. What's the time frame that you usually invest in this side of it so that people could leave here and go, they don't overanalyze and think, man, I'm planning my day all day. I don't know what to do. And they don't underdo it or they're just kind of like, Oh, okay. I, I have to do these things, whatever. I'm going to write them down. How are you prioritizing your day? Is there like a, a formula that you use? Well, I use the six steps and my father used to say that you can do it in the morning before you start. It takes five minutes and it'll increase it by five, five minutes. minutes throughout cool. the day. But I like to do it the night before or the, after my day's work. So I'm very clear and intentional. And I'm a huge believer in when you sleep, your whole mind is processing all of the information. So right before you go to bed is like the most crucial time. Your, your brain is going into beta mode, which is slower vibrations. So it's easier to 
uh, take in information. So if I'm sleeping with the intention that when I wake up, all of these things are going to happen. Like this morning, I woke up at six and all and a, and my email for the day just flowed out of me. Like I couldn't even see. I'm like, I can't see my eyes hurt. And I'm typing it out because while I was sleeping, this it just was processing. And I, I think that that's one of my favorite emails I've ever written was what we went out to our database today with because it was just so powerful. And I really believe in the power of your subconscious mind and programming it before you go to bed. You could tell that I don't, I, I haven't known you long, a few months now, and I've been watching you from afar yet. I feel that you're in that mode right now that, you know, we look back on in our lives and go, Oh my gosh, like I was in it. I was excited. Like you're waking up at six, like writing an email with your eyes closed. That's when you're really in it and capturing those times. I don't know how it's always been yet. I can tell you're in that awesome state, which is amazing that we did the interview now because I'm capturing this moment and the energy that people can get from it. We talk about some things are better caught than taught. Sometimes it's just catching your energy and, and your focus and kind of taking it on more than just even the words you're saying, right? They say English or, or words were not our first language, but posture and, and body language and facial expressions and all that is definitely more so of the things that we learn first. So take me through a little bit about what you're working on now. I want to make sure that the people listening can get involved with some of the things that you're doing right this second, especially because you're getting three hours of sleep every single night and you're working so hard and putting out all this energy. I would hate to leave here and they go, oh, I'll grab the book, but then they don't know what else is going on. So please take me through it. And I want to know for myself as well. So my father created this concept called the Dream 100. It's the fastest, least expensive way to double your sales. He, another one that came from Charlie Munger days. Uh, and he realized that when he got a list of 2000 different advertisers and he said, okay, I have to cold call all of these people. He, he did some research and he realized that only 167 of them purchased 95% of his product. So instead of going after 2000, he did an intensive effort to just the 167. Mm -hmm. so that's when the dream 100 was, was born. So there's a smaller number of ideal buyers compared to all buyers that will spend more with you more often and it will be cheaper to market to only those smaller buyers because you're not marketing to all of them, right? So, so that is what the premise of the Dream 100 is. And over time, it has evolved. You know, people like Russell Brunson have taken it on and started teaching it as well. And I'm so grateful for that, how my father's legacy has just bloomed. But being in Clubhouse, I would step into these rooms and people say, yeah, the Dream 100, yeah, the Dream 100. And I'm like, who are you? Who is Everybody's talking about the Dream 100. And I found that there was this lack of understanding what the Dream 100 was actually about. It had become about, you know, sending somebody a gift and then they post it on social media and they see the picture and they're like, ha, I did the Dream 100. The Dream 100 is about doubling sales, not getting likes on Facebook or Instagram. So from that understanding on Clubhouse, we bore this new Dream 100 course where it's my father's principles, timeless, amazing. And then I've added in, okay, this is what you need to know in today's world. You know, this is how people are messing up. These are the biggest mistakes. So the dream100.com launched yesterday. Ah. You got the dream100.com? <laughs> yeah. Impressive. It should be. My father was the godfather of the dream 100. How can it right, not? But we know how people do things nowadays. It, I'm surprised you got that, right? It's like, the dream100.com must have been not easy to get. Uh, that's wild. But yeah, you're correct. He should be the one who gets the credit for it. And there is so many people. And what you're talking about is cool because most people that I've heard talk about Dream 100, which I've heard for years, five years now, <laughs> never mention your father, by the way, uh, either, none of them. And, and maybe it's because they didn't learn. They learned it from someone who taught them that learned it from your father. So they're giving credit to whoever. I get credit from Russell for saying your mess is your message in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And I get messages, hate messages all the time. You're not the first one who said that. And I'm like, I know, but I'm happy to take the, because no one really knows who said it, but I'm happy, I'm happy that he heard it from me. Yet so uh, when it comes to the doubling the sales part, that's what I love about it. Because what I've heard is most people do it for partnerships. They say, oh, you know, man, it's got this big audience of, of business owners. I'm going to send her a gift in the mail that's tailored or not tailored to, they become less tailored nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been dream 100 did 
quite a few times. Uh, sorry to the people that have done that. And I usually get like long written printed out pieces of paper with like a toy. And I'm like, this thing's like 99 cents. I don't like it. And I don't like reading long piece of paper. I've never finished one ever. I'm, I know it's terrible of me. I apologize in advance. Yeah, I've never done it because it wasn't tailored to me. And I just felt like, oh, I'm getting Dream 100 in, in the wrong way. So doubling sales, not just creating a partnership or, or someone who can promote your stuff, yet actually focusing on, I'm thinking about one of our guys, Nate, who sells produce to Panera Bread and all these different people. Okay. And like, oh, wow, why, why don't, instead of him trying to go after everyone, why doesn't he just go after like the top 100 buyers of produce and just do your version of Dream 100 where he can stop making all these calls to people that never buy and start focusing on your method. So how do we get involved? Because are you doing a challenge? Are you doing like, what, what does it look like? I need to make sure that we get involved with this. At the moment, so I've just launched it to a small group of people just to make sure that we start getting people through it and they've experienced it. So the dream100.com, people can go and, and get get from now until Monday. I don't know when this is launching, but Monday we still have a special price and then it'll bump up and I'll bring more people in. But at the moment, it's just creating that core group of people that want to go through it and experience it. And, and I get their feedback and their testimonials. And I mean, we have great testimonials. Don't get me wrong. We've been doing it for 30 years now. But uh, yeah, a new, a new level, a new version of it. And even the thing is, is that like, I, I was in the health and fitness game for a long time because I was 60 pounds heavier. I lost the weight. And I was consistently always looking for how I could be fit. Worked out with Navy SEALs for three and a half years, every, six days a week. And there's times still where I'm like, even though I knew it and I did it, there's times where you just get that 3% off course. How they talk about like planes getting off course and not course correcting. It happens to everyone. And what I've noticed, I just created a, a training actually for the podcast that was about the top things, the top success habits that I found from people like yourself that I bring on an interview is that they're such good students. I'm so impressed. I have Peng Jun, great friend of mine, always in the front row, always taking notes at every event, every event, asking questions to everyone and learning from people where I'm like, this guy, you have a hundred times bigger business than this guy. And he's like, oh, how did you, always a student. And so right now for someone to, to realize that someone's on the path to destruction is a person that is like, I already know that. That's like the worst case sign. I know that no one listening here would have that. Yet I know that people out there definitely have seen other people that have those destructive behaviors that know it all. And when what happens is that when someone knows it all, we we end up modeling it. If we look up to them, we're like, oh, I'm not supposed to show up and go to these trains. I already know Dream 100. Oh, I don't do courses or or little things. I need to only go to the big stuff. It's it's just not about it. It's about learning and growing. So I'm looking forward to learning and growing from some of the stuff that you guys are teaching. Getting the book. Talked about that ultimate sales machine. Got to get the book. Uh, I got to get the book. Other people out there, you're going to want to get it as well. And Amanda, thank you so much for investing time with us and bringing in not only the the time management secrets of billionaires, legit bil billionaires, not just studying from afar, but studying close with, right. yeah. and also sharing some of the stuff with Dream 100, some of the things that p maybe have been debunked now by you. And then it's about doubling sales. And there's an originator that it came from that we could learn from. And that is now you, which I'm excited about, the dream100.com. Thank you so much. I've had such a blast. I look forward to it. I actually think I could interview you about Dream 100 failures and how you've gotten so many that you hated. I would love to do one on that, actually. They've never worked, ever. I love that. Oh my gosh. I want to do that. We have to and, do and that. And some of them are like my friends where I'm just like, hey, if you just like messaged me, I would help. But like you sent me this really weird like basketball in the mail with a long form sales letter. And I know that you sent the same exact thing to everyone else. And just because of that, I don't feel special anymore. Whereas I, I love things like Gary Vaynerchuk where he's before said, oh man, like I saw a guy, I saw that he loved the Knicks. And so I, I bought him a signed jersey. And I'm like, oh wow, like that, that actually is cool. Like if someone saw something that I liked, I'd be like, whoa, they, they invested time here. But it actually worked against them. The fact that they sent me something so generic that I knew I was just getting textbook Dream 100 did, if that's a thing. Uh, and it's not even textbook. It's like forgery textbook. Okay, now I'm getting too far into it. But that'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. 
And know. also for the people listening, what you don't know is that I had a man to sit here and be my tech person, my <laughs> sound tech person for like 30 minutes to make sure this happened. So next time, if we do the interview, which we will, of bad dream 100s, I'll make sure that we don't have any tech issues for you. That was definitely fun. I'm used to it. I'm used to it. I was an audio engineer and around audio engineers all the time. So I'm, I'm, I studied it. I know how, how difficult video and audio can be. So. Well, thank you so much. Is there another place that people go check you out? I know you're active on Instagram. People can see the updates of what's going on with Dream 100. Is that the best place to follow you? Yeah, you could go on Instagram. My name on Instagram is Amandita. Holmes, because Amanda Holmes was taken. We used my salt. <laughs> so he, he, yeah, that <laughs> that's hilarious. Thank you got you. you got the dream100.com, right? Dream100.com. Yeah, and, yeah. and you can't get your own name on Instagram. That's something that we need to change. We need to reach out to the Amanda Holmes <laughs> and get her to, to switch over the username. But thank you so much. That was super fun. And I'm excited to do the debunking of Dream 100. Oh, Yes, that's a good title too. Okay. Yes, thank you. It's been thank a you. Time.